Well, I'm hearing the noon whistle here in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, so it's time for me to say that this is Steve Larson with the Horde Dairyman staff up here. We welcome all of you uh, that are with us today uh, for our monthly webinar. Uh, the topic today will be barn design for robotic milking. The sponsor is Lely, and uh, we appreciate their support. And uh, we welcome uh, today uh, my, our co-host, Mike Hutchins, down there at the University of Illinois, and always want to express our appreciation to Jim Baltz, his uh, partner down there that helps with with uh, many of, of the details. Uh, just a note here, uh, some of you already know that uh, if you go to the handout section of your menu on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, you would be able to print out today's PowerPoints, PDFs of the PowerPoints if you'd like to have them uh, to follow along. Uh, and you can print them out anytime, actually, uh, during the webinar today. So with that, I will... Uh, turn control of the webinar over to uh, Mike Hutchins and let him introduce our presenter for today. Mike? Very good, Steve. Well, thank you very much. And it's my honor, both professionally and personally, to introduce Jack Rodenberg. Uh, Jack uh, immigrated from Holland uh, as a child back in 1960 and grew up on a dairy farm in Ontario. Uh, he graduated from the University of Guelph in 1974 and then had uh, 34 very productive years as an extension specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Uh, I guess I referred to as OMAF. I'm not sure I'm saying it quite correctly there. Uh, after he retired, he uh, started his uh, consulting company known as Dairy uh, Logic and uh, he does a lot of uh, consulting both in Canada, Europe, and the United States on robotic feeding systems and troubleshooting factors that impact that. And, of course, we'll hear a lot about that here today as well. Jack is also certified as a cow signals trainer, a uh, very popular program that came over from, uh, from the Netherlands here and uh, does a lot of work there, and he has authored three books in that area. So, Jack, it sounds like you're keeping very busy after you're, after retiring here, and we welcome you here to the Hordes webinar and turn the program over to you, and you're off and running. Okay, thank you, Mike, and uh, looking forward to it. This is my uh, only my second experience in doing a webinar, so uh, I hope we don't have too many difficulties, but I would like to start right off with getting to know my audience a little bit. So I have a poll question here. If you are a dairy producer, are you thinking about robotic milking? Uh, so five categories, you're already milking with robots, uh, your plans are pretty well made up and you're going to start in the next two years, you might be starting two to three years from now, uh, you're just thinking about it or uh, uh, not likely but uh, curious and uh, had some time at lunch to sit down and watch us today. Well, very well, good. We're, we're off and running here, Steve. Uh, comments? Oh, but the voting started quick. If I was going to respond for the Words Dairyman Farm, I would be somewhere between two and three. <laughs> or, I mean, no, between three and four. Okay, we're thinking about it maybe within two or three years. We've got, uh, we've, uh, we've visited a lot of farms. Uh, we've uh, uh, given, given it quite a bit of thought, actually. So, uh, with labor situation and all, uh, it, I wouldn't rule out robotics uh, on the horse dairyman farm uh, at some point in the future. Let me put it that way. Well, let's go ahead and close it, Jim. I think we've uh, got uh, all we're going to get here because obviously a number of our people are not. Uh, Jack, what do you? Uh, what's your take on the results of your poll, your audience? Well, interesting. Uh, probably uh, a little uh, lower on the uptake side than I had expected. Uh, you know, less than ten percent using robots now. Uh, Fourteen percent thinking of definite plans. Twenty-two uh, percent most likely. So uh, the majority, I uh, think, is still uh, uh, unsure and curious. Uh, and that's fine. That's perhaps, I think, where the U.S. industry as a whole is probably at. Uh, here in Canada, we're a little further along than that. And in my own mind, I'm just very uh, excited about robotic milking uh, in total. I uh, also would like to know uh, what, uh, what people are thinking in terms of herd size, because robotics does change a lot and, uh, with herd size. And so, again, so we know what we're talking about. I'd love to see a response to this, uh, to this question here. 120 cows or less, so essentially a two-robot barn, 
120 to 240, so that's 4, 240 to 500. That's uh, starting to get pretty big for robots, uh, eight robots, and then, of course, the very large herds. That interest is just starting to awaken uh, as far as I can see it right now. Well, Steve, hey. Steve, how many cows are you? Um, well, we we would be in the 500 to 1,000 category, although I would say that not all of our cows would be milked by robots. It would probably either be a, a, at another operation that we have uh, away from the main farm or a new barn that we built that was tailor-made for robotics. And that's why we're especially interested in this topic today. Well, Jim, let's go ahead and close the poll. I think we've got our same number as before there. So, uh, Jack, you can kind of see what type of herd sizes you're, you're talking to today. Yeah, and that uh, actually uh, pleases me on the on the high end. Certainly, we know there's lots of interest in uh, you know 120 cow herds and less, and 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 so on. Uh, interesting to see 14% uh, over 1,000 and 11% over 500. Uh, I, until the last year or two, I think those people would not have expressed an interest in attending a webinar on robotic milking because it was just not viewed as, uh, as suiting that situation. Right now, I'm actually writing a book chapter for the American Dairy Science Association for their new uh, large herd management book on applying robotics to the large herds. And, and so I'm very interested in researching that further and uh, sorting out what's going to work well for people. Okay, so uh, you probably understand by now that I'm very passionate about this. I think robotic milking can do a tremendous amount to reduce dairy farm labor and on the smaller farms also improve uh, the, the lifestyle of the operator. Uh, I can see where if it's properly implemented, you can reduce labor in the barn by as close to 30 to 40 percent. Uh, very often, uh, we don't succeed at that in practice and, and the reasons for failure that I see that come up all the time, one is that we don't provide facilities for efficient separation and handling. So now we no longer milk but now we spend half the day chasing cows around uh, because we have not thought about uh, finding a good way to, to deal with individual cow handling. The second thing is that we fail to provide for special needs cows like fresh cows and lame cows and you'd like to have those close to the robots and, and, and in an environment where they're going to thrive. Uh, and then the third thing is that we sometimes, not as often, fail to recognize the impact of the behavior and social rank of the cow on voluntary attendance and especially in free traffic barns that's really really important. So now here's a, a diagram that uh, actually was sent to me by an American and I left it totally untouched. Uh, there's two things that stand out here. One, I would really like to get the terminology working and working well for us. So what's called free flow here to me would be free traffic and what's missing here is a fetch pen uh, over here that you would only put cows in that do not go on their own and it would give them direct access to one of those robots what they call limited flow here is also a free traffic area but in order to get cows in and out of this special needs area they've created what I call a commitment pen and a commitment pen is not something I like very much so in American farms I see that very often uh, the robots are put on the outside of the barn easy to do for a renovation uh, I think the dealers love this because they can get their chemicals right in there easily and get their truck right up to the door. Uh, but I don't think it's a very convenient way to set up robotic milking for cows. And, and the problem on the blue side here is that there's no sort capability. So a cow goes into the robot and always returns to the group she comes from. There's no way to separate her out. So now you have to go looking for that cow if you want to give her any treatment or if you want to examine her by the vet or whatever, you're going to always use lots of headlocks in these kind of barns. Uh, and um, unless you plan any activity around a, car, a cow during the time that she's locked up, uh, you're gonna have real challenges uh, with individual cow handling. Over on the green side, 
Uh, to me, the limitation here is this commitment pen. So in order to get cows in and out of that special needs area by a selection gate on the exit from the commitment pen, uh, essentially all of the cows now have to go in here to be milked. Uh, and you could be in here a long time, especially if you're a timid cow. So you go in, you're waiting for the next available robot, but a bigger cow comes in after you. She goes in the robot, another one comes in, another one comes in, and an hour and a half later, you're still there and looking for a place to lay down. And, and that's uh, a cause to me of uh, uh, ruminacidosis from uh, you know, infrequent meals, a cause of lameness, from too much standing and so on. So I do not like this kind of barn design uh, very much at all. I like to put the robots inside the barn. So my last poll question, uh, if you are considering robotic milking, uh, is it going to be a renovation of an existing barn? And if it is, are you most likely to go to free traffic or guided traffic? Uh, so that's the second option, a renovation of an existing barn with guided traffic. So free traffic, number one, guided traffic, number two, and then a new barn, free traffic, number three, a new barn with guided traffic, number four. And I love the way people answer these questions very quickly. Yep, we're coming oh, in very quick. Are. Oh, boy, Mike, what would you do if you were uh, building a barn? No oh, barn, let's see. Yeah, let's see. boy, I tell you. I, I'm not sure quite for, uh, maybe Jack will give us a little bit more clarity on the tree, free traffic and guided traffic uh, concepts there, but uh, guided traffic sounds better. We'll see what he has to say, and we'll see what uh, what the uh, poll takers. Yep, we're up, we're up to saying. our numbers again. So, Jim, let's uh, show okay. it to our people and see what we have. All right, so it looks like among the, the, the Renaults, it's a 50-50 split. And it makes sense that you might go more likely go to Guided with a Renault because your, your potential your possibilities are less. The majority seems to be for a new barn with free traffic. And so I'm glad to have them on side because that's uh, where I would land unless there were very strong reasons to go in a different direction. And, and we'll show you through the presentation, uh, I think, where the benefits of that come in, and it should be fairly obvious as we go. So uh, as a base barn, I want to show you uh, this layout, and, and there's about a dozen things that make this the right, the, one of the right ways to do it. And uh, there are certainly other ways that you can achieve the same thing, but I just want to use a consistent layout so that we can uh, touch on those dozen points through the presentation. So I want you to be fairly familiar with this barn. So essentially we've got perimeter feeding. So we've got two drive-through feed alleys, one on each side on the outside of the barn. Then we have 120 comfortable free stalls for milking cows up above the screen in six rows, so three head-to-head -head platforms. The robots are in the middle of the barn. They both uh, face in the same direction. So cows flowing in the same direction, a fetch pen beside each one, and a central handling area with usually one handling chute. This one shows two, uh, and then uh, you know, a place to, uh, to, uh, to park your records and perhaps a computer and some water and electricity. Then behind this robot, there is a bedding pack for fresh and lame cows that can be milked in this circle maternity pens behind that and your close-up pen behind that. So we call this in, in our cow signals courses, we call this a stress-free calving line because the cow's environment does not change very much through that period and all those cows are fed right there. Over here you'd have a couple of separation stalls and then behind that free stalls for uh, dry cows, for far off dry cows and that gives you some flexibility here that I'll show you later. You might put your oldest heifers back here as well so you can train them uh, when you're not doing anything else. So essentially that's the barn we're going to talk about uh, and then perhaps throw in some other features as well. This office is nicely in line with the robots, so short lines for, uh, for milk uh, storage and so on. If you're adding more robots, three and four would go on this center platform 
and then you'd have two groups of 120 cows each by lengthening the barn. So yeah, it's important we recognize that cows have to go to this robot on their own, especially in a free traffic setting. So we need to make the environment as, as comfortable for that as we can, and we need to have healthy cows with good feet. So lameness decreases robot visits, increases the number of cows you have to fetch, decreases milk production, more so than in a, in a parlor barn, because uh, the cow has to go on her own, uh, and she's less likely to do that if she has sore feet. So we think of four, uh, four feet to stand on. One is good claw quality, one is low infection rates, the third one low pressure on the claws, and then the fourth one is getting them uh, treated, both in terms of prevention and, and uh, dealing with disease issues and so on. So how does this relate to the barn? Well, to get good claw quality, you need to keep the heel deep and keep the toe short, so you need a place for routine trimming. In terms of infection rates, uh, you know, you want to keep the foot clean and dry, so that means comfortable stalls. So they spend 14 hours a day laying down uh, with clean feet and clean alleys as well so that they're not walking around in manure all the time. Uh, low pressure would mean, again, comfortable stalls, so cows spend time laying down, and then perhaps a bedding pack for problem cows so that a lame cow has a really good place to recover uh, from her problems, and you put that close to the robot. In terms of treatment, uh, you've got preventative treatment with foot baths, you've got to have the ability to stick this cow in a handling chute quickly, uh, pick a foot up and have a look at it, and I really recommend that on a robotic milking dairy, uh, the owner or the person, the herdsman in charge, uh, should have some skills at uh, actually, you know, hoof trimming or or, or some uh, some maintenance work on hooves. You might not want to do it all, and so that you can respond very quickly to a problem. Foot baths have been a real challenge in robot barns. Because when we put them in the exit lane like this, it discourages visits by the cow. We'll get 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, less milkings per cow on the day that there's chemical in here because cows don't like it. Uh, and the number of passes is highly variable. So a frequent visitor in a free traffic barn is going to be milked four times a day and then she's going to have three more refusals she's going through that foot bath seven times more than she needs and she's going to drop manure in it so the chemicals don't work as well and so on for the other cows so uh, this is not a very desirable kind of situation so what have people started doing well we'll put a foot bath in a lane and the far crossover far away from the robot we don't get the disruption to robot visits <coughs> You can give all cows the same number of passes by walking them around the barn once or twice. The chemicals is fresh, so it works better, and it's away from the milk and, and delicate metal parts and so on. So those are all pluses. Uh, and, and in larger herds, we'll put a big foot bath right across the, uh, the, the crossover and walk cows through uh, four or five at a time. The, uh, the, the, the downside of this is that if you think about it behaviorally, all week long you're looking to pick out one or two cows that are fetch cows and bring them along with you to the robot, but now twice a week on foot bathing day you want to gather the whole herd up and, and, and drive them through here, uh, and that just does not suit the behavior pattern of these cows anymore. Uh, so I'm very frustrated by this and I don't think it works as well as people uh, I like to uh, would, would like it to work. My approach now is let's put this foot bath in a separation lane. So here, a cow exiting a robot that doesn't need foot bathing goes straight out the end gate with gate C uh, parallel to the line of traffic. A separation cow uh, follows the uh, the brown arrow here into the separation area and you program the computer on foot bathing day to send every cow in that direction once or twice, uh, whatever your, uh, your interest is, uh, by having a second sort date here at D, so three-way sorting uh, to bring that cow back into the main herd. And two robots laid out in this L layout, a cow milking robot one can be diverted into the fetch pen of robot two, 
and then milked and then uh, refused in robot two and returned to the herd in that way. And that refusal will cost you uh, well, probably two to three milkings for that day uh, because there's a little more traffic through that robot. But this is working very well for us in a number of barns. You'll see the odd cow that slows down here in this turning point a little bit. And so you might want to put an extra encourager there uh, to uh, give her a little shock if she doesn't uh, continue to move along the rest of the way. So another area that's really challenging is handling individual cows in a robot barn. So we need to be able to sort them at the robot exit, and we need to be able to do that over about a 12-hour period uh, prior to the time that you need to work with the cows. So if the vet is coming at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, to do herd health, then probably 8 o'clock at night you want to program the computer to start separating those cows. You're going to sort them into a space with feed and water and, and stalls to rest in and milking access as well. And that's a challenge in a lot of barn layouts. And then you have to provide a shoot for hoof care and other treatments and so on uh, in an easily accessible location. So here's how my six row barn is going to work here cow coming into this robot gets sorted into this space and there are two free stalls here for the rest in they eat there cows coming into this robot get sorted into the same area and during the time that they're here and waiting they can be milked again by uh, following a circle uh, around that robot uh, and, and all this, this, this whole central handling area is very accessible to all the groups in the barn. The fresh and lame cows are close by, the calving pens are, the close-up cows, the dry cows. So this is centrally located, so it's very convenient to take a cow from anywhere there if you want to pick up her feet or whatever. And you need to design the gating so that one person working alone can move any cow to that shoot from any part of the barn without having to bring anybody else in. So there is one of these shoots. Uh, the place to handle cows individually, and as I said earlier, uh, a robot farmer should have a bit of an understanding of basic hoof care. Uh, so you can take a lame cow uh, that's no longer coming to the robot on her own, and when you fetch your programmer right into this space and pick up her foot after the milking. I like to put a computer here, equipment storage, water, electricity, uh, to make everything very convenient for handling. So there is uh, you know, a computer screen, and, and, and so you can program the cow right here after you treat her with antibiotics uh, to make sure that the milk is discarded, etc. If you're looking at group handling, so there's two options really here, headlocks throughout the barn, or a separation area that's big enough to handle uh, a, a bigger number of cows. You know, in the separation area I showed you earlier, there was really only two free stalls in there. So what kind of group handling are you going to do? Uh, one big job is flaming udders. Uh, if the laser is going to find the teats, you want to have clean udders. And so a lot of robot herds will do this once every six weeks to two months, especially in the, in the colder winter period. And there's no easier way to do that than if all the cows are, are lined up at headlocks and you just run along and, uh, and flame them. The other group handling is reproductive herd health. And for that, you might want to have 20% of the, the herd separated uh, when the veterinarian appears. And so that's also possible to do with all the cows locked up. But now you're locking up 100 cows you don't need in order to examine 20 cows you do and that's a bit stressful on those cows and so on. So if we're talking about headlocks throughout, a six row barn obviously does not have enough manger space to lock up all the cows, so you do some strategic gating back here in your dry cow area and in your maternity and, and, and uh, fresh cow pen and so that you can lock those cows back and then have that additional manger space for additional headlocks so you can lock up all the cows at once. If we're going to do our handling by separating the cows out, these two stalls obviously isn't enough. And so what you might do is the day before you do the handling, take as many far off dry cows as might go into the close-up group in the next few days and move them. So you minimize the number of cows here, 
then you crowd those far out dry cows and steal a bunch of stalls for the one night, maybe 16 stalls. And in 16 stalls, I think you can easily separate you know, 24 to 30 cows because the last dozen don't come until very close to the time before the bed arrives. Anyways, now you can headlock them here. You can run them through a management rail here if that's your preference. You can run them through two side-by-side -side chutes where the herdsman moves the cow while the vet checks this one and back and forth. And uh, there's a number of choices for how you do the actual handling. Uh, my preference would probably be for the management rail, especially if you're also going to do your other flaming uh, in that location uh, as well. I also want to make sure that we do a good job of looking after uh, the fresh cows and the, uh, the compromised cows, as I've said earlier, lame cows are a big issue in robot barns. They need to have an opportunity to recover. The best place for that is in a straw pack. So I love to design these barns with a straw pack behind one of the robots for fresh and lame cows. And they'll eat here and they'll have free access to this robot. Uh, following this, uh, this circle here through the fetch pen uh, and, and, and back uh, to the area they come from uh, through the separation point here. So yeah, you could put your close-up pen behind that, you could put your maternity pens in between. Now you just have one area of the barn that has straw bedding in it that can be cleaned out at the same time, that can be bedded at the same time. Uh, and that works out to be uh, a fairly practical approach if those uh, other cows are in the barn as well. Here's a barn where we've done that. Owner's very, very happy with it. And uh, this is one of the highest producing free traffic deal of owl barns in North America. Uh, and and uh, as I say, it has these straw pens in behind here, four fresh and lame cows and four close up cows uh, in that area. Healthy feet, just one more quick point I want to make about healthy feet uh, is that we can't tractor scrape these barns. That's too disruptive uh, for the cows uh, to have a tractor in there three times a day. So we're into slats or flush or alley scrapers and alley scrapers create this manure bath and the longer the barn, the bigger the manure bath and the more you start to see clean burns and dirty, dirty feet on cows because every time it passes they end up walking through that manure uh, and that's a real frustration especially in larger robot barns. This is one of the largest robot barns around is Mason Dixon Farms in Pennsylvania uh, and they have put their cows on a raised platform with barriers in between so that when they're eating, so this is six hours a day, uh, four to six hours a day, the manure scraper can pass behind them, so they're not getting dirty feet. And the other thing here is that when they're in this alley, uh, underneath the floor, there is, and then this is a round example, but theirs is, is rectangular, I think, there is a two inch gap and then a tube under the floor and so the alley scraper now just collects the manure, drops it through that gap into the tube, uh, and then underneath the scraper there is a paddle in the tube that moves it along to the end of the barn. So the cow's feet stay much cleaner because most of the manure is actually transferred in the tube. So healthy feet means well-rested feet. And well-rested cows are cows that have the freedom to do whatever they want, when they want, and free traffic is going to promote longer resting times for these cows. And this is, I realize, a fairly extreme example, but this is a guided traffic barn here in Ontario uh, that is a feed-first barn. So at the far end of the barn, cows can go through a one-way gate out to the feed manger. Uh, then when they're done their meal, they have to come up this lane to this pre-selection gate. Uh, if they're eligible for milking, they go into the commitment pen, and then they get milk through the robot, put back out to the feed manger, come back up the lane a second time. Now they're not eligible for milking. They go to this area that has a computer feeder in it, and then they're returned to the freestall resting area of the barn. And uh, surprisingly, cows are really quite good at figuring this out. Uh, with the guided traffic, you do get many fewer fetch cows, 
so there's less labor in the barn. But the cows do not like standing here waiting. They do not like someone telling them what to do. So they will go to the manger less often, probably six to seven times a day instead of 12 times a day. So we get fewer meals. And they do spend time waiting in line, as you can see here. Uh, and that's going to create some food issues and so on, especially when things go a little bit wrong. Like right here, you know, cows are not moving. And I, I think these are pretty good, uh, aggressive looking animals here. And that heifer is probably a little more timid and smaller. And she's not going anywhere until these cows are gone. So she's going to wait in front of this gate. She has to wait anyways because she's not going to get milk before then. But all of the cows behind her are waiting as well. And they may actually be on their way to the free stalls. Uh, and this is all just extra time standing. Uh, so yeah, here's another way to do the guided, uh, the guided traffic. And this looks way worse. But actually, if you think about it, at least this cow uh, is going to be is going to be milked in what uh, six and twelve. So in fifteen minutes or so, it's going to be her turn, no matter how big or small she is. And so at least they're all milked in the order that they come in, but they are standing in a very stressful place while they wait. If this were a commitment pen instead, then this cow could come in here and other cows could continually go into the robot ahead of her, uh, which would make life very stressful because it could take her two hours to get milk. So to summarize, guided traffic decreases the emphasis on feeding in the robot, reduces the number of fetch cows. And so when there are really strong economic incentives to do that, it may be justified. But cow comfort will always be poor, especially if the barn is at or near capacity. In a free cow traffic barn, uh, you're going to have uh, better cow comfort, especially for timid cows, because they can go away, go back and rest if they want to. Uh, you will have more fetch cows. But sometimes if you have a new fetch cow, uh, you know, she's probably become a fetch cow because she has a case of mastitis or because she's going lame. So, you know, fetching, it takes time, but it often can also tell you things about the cows and offer some management information and give you some things that you uh, want to look at correcting. So to summarize, I think both can work very well with good management. Uh, but when things go a little bit wrong, then with guided traffic, it's the cows that suffer because they get fewer meals and longer waiting times and foot health issues and rumen health issues and so on. Uh, with free traffic, if things go a little bit wrong, it's the farmer who suffers because he has to fetch more cows. So that's going to be a good warning step to, uh, to uh, step up your management. And I design for both, but for me, cow comfort is just absolutely key. So I have a strong preference for, uh, for free traffic barns. The key to making free traffic work is to give cows lots of space and space with escape routes. So I plan all my barns with about 20 feet uh, in front of the robot uh, of free space. And again, that adds some labor because you do have to keep that clean. But you can see here uh, you know, an escape route. So if a timid cow is waiting here and the boss cow comes from here, she can escape up this alley. If the boss cow is coming from there, she can ex escape up, uh, up this alley. And you don't want any more traffic here than necessary. So you place brushes and grazeway gates and so on at the other end of the barn. Uh, if you uh, if you can do that, you'd want some water here because very often, right after milking, uh, a cow would be looking for a drink. If you are choosing guided traffic, the same principles apply. So provide multiple routes between the two areas of the barn, lots of open space on all sides of the selection gates, and stay away from the commitment pens if you can. If you're going with uh, say a milk first system. Uh, just let the cow approach the robot from the resting area, and if she uh, is, uh, can't get in, she can go and lay down again rather than being stuck in a commitment pen. So you know, here's a wider one-way gate, so no one can block this. There's lots of open space here in front of this selection gate, 
And so again, uh, you know, no one cow can prevent others from moving through it. With robotics, you're going to uh, get rid of a lot of labor of milking, but you're also going to see some new labor. You have to fetch these cows that don't attend voluntarily. And if things are well run, that should be, uh, you know, 2 to 5%. I'm going up to 10% here, but uh, we see a lot of farms now that are much lower than that consistently. And they're just fetching new cows and cows that haven't been trained yet and so on. So, yeah, you design the barn and manage the herd so that you have a minimum number of these fetch cows. And then you provide a simple route uh, so that you can do that and low, st low stress fetch pens along with it. So uh, and all, you pull a gate down here and a gate down here where the blue lines are. You start cleaning free stalls here. You keep the cows you're fetching in front of you. I like to start along the feed manger because it's easier to keep cows. It's, it's harder to keep cows separated here than between the stalls. So the fewer cows you have in front of you, as far as fetch cows, the better. You go around the end of the barn bring them up this side and into the fetch pen here. On the other side, you reverse it so that you do the manger first, bring them across the front of the robot into this fetch pen, open all your gates and the, and the job is done. These fetch pens are what, uh, what we call a split entry fetch pen. And I think that's a wonderful learning environment for the cow. So the cows from the barn, they still have access because they just push this swinging gate to the right. The cows in the fetch pen just push it to the left and they have a little higher priority access because the robot actually opens for them first because they're close to the robot. So if you think about this as a school for cows in terms of behavior, a cow has never seen the robot before. You put her in the fetch pen, you pull this uh, little helper gate up beside her, you wait for the robot to open, you put your shoulder in her butt and you push her in. So that's day one. She knows nothing. She learns there's something good to eat there, and hopefully tomorrow she'll do better. So the next day you put her in the fetch pen, you pull the gate up beside her and chain it behind her and leave her there. So she needs to take the last step on her own, uh, and, and that's the next learning step. The next day you leave her in the fetch pen, and she has to take the last ten steps on her own, and when she willingly does that, she can return her to the herd. Uh, so I, I think that's a very good approach, and this, this uh, split entry fetch pen is now being used right around the world, and it's something that we kind of developed here uh, years ago and are, are kind of proud of. If you have the opportunity, train your heifers especially to use one-way gates before they calve, and uh, you know, put some in the heifer barn somewhere. I would not use this one. It looks like a fence. So uh, very difficult for a cow to learn that you can walk through that. The saloon gate has a bit of a hole in it, and so that's helpful to them and, and teaches them to go there. And these finger gates, I think, are just ideal because uh, cows adapt to them very, very easily and very readily. If you are not separating cows on a given day and you want to use this robot, you have a little spare time, then bring some of these close-up heifers out of the, the pen back here, or, or even younger heifers housed elsewhere in the barn. Bring them up into this fetch pen, show them that there's some grain to eat in here and a machine that moves around and makes some noise and, and, and send them back, and then there'd be that much less stress on them at calving time. So I think, you know, this barn also allows simple rooting from group to group because your dry cows move over your close-up pen, calving pen, fresh pen into the main barn, sorted back out into a dry cow group, never cross a feed alley, uh, always, you know, simple gating between them and so on. So hopefully that will bring across the benefits of the perimeter feeding, which we're not used to, but it really helps to keep all of the cows central in the barn. It lets you be flexible about group sizes and so on and so forth. Now this barn will cost more money by having a 16-foot alley here and a 16-foot alley here instead of one 20-foot alley down the center. The barn gets wider. But these head-to-head -head platforms are usually fine at 16 or 17 feet, whereas if we had one against the wall, you know, you'd be looking at 10 feet for that stall. So uh, net difference, 6 to 8 feet wider than a center drive-through. 
you get all the benefits for robotic milking of having the cows together. Additional benefit, rain and sun tend to end up in here, and so you have a more comfortable environment for the cows as well by being a little bit further away from the wall. So yeah, you do have to have a 14-foot high sidewall minimum to get a 12-foot high overhead door in here uh, to get a bigger TMR mixer in and so on. But yeah, the barn will cost more if it's uh, six feet wider than a center drive through barn. These barns are about one foot long per cow. Uh, so you're looking at adding uh, six to eight square feet uh, of barn space per cow. So whatever that's worth, 25 bucks a foot, you're looking at $150 per cow. Uh, higher cost for this barn. Cows never leave the barn, uh, so big equipment is disruptive. And, and here's a barn with sand bedding. I love sand bedding. I, I want to use it. This is a, a, a guided traffic barn, so bringing machinery through here really disrupts things because it puts all the cows uh, into, the, uh, into the feeding alley and so on. So definitely free traffic would work better here. And I tried to design these barns so that there are straight lines through everywhere so that you and your sand slinger can be in and out of there very quickly. Uh, and I mean, this principle applies to, uh, to non-robot barns as well. But as I mentioned earlier, tractor scraping disturbs the cows. It's not really an option. So slats, scrapers, or flush. Uh, are the choices we have. Uh, if you can automate bedding, that again would be one task where you're not disrupting the cows coming through with, uh, with uh, so your bedding slinger and that sort of thing. Uh, so that is being done as well uh, and uh, it's, it's fairly interesting technology to me. As a closing point, I think you want to build these robot barns to be expandable because when you reduce the labor especially on a family-run dairy, uh, you might soon be looking at, at milking more cows. So I like my robots all facing the same way. That way cows don't have to relearn how they get to a robotic milking stall and so on if they're put in another group. So if we start with a two-robot barn with two robots like this, you put two on a center platform, one facing this way, one facing that way. You now have a four robot barn for 250 cows. Um, the problem stall here is this one, because if you want to sort from it into your handling space back here, you're going to have to divert that cow into the fetch pen that's behind this robot, then refuse her through this robot and move her into that separation area. And I have a number of barns set up this way and actually are working quite well. You can mirror image that four robot barn now and make it an eight robot barn with your handling in the center. So now you're good for about 500 cows. I'm not sure you would want all the dry cows in here. You probably want to put them off in a separate barn and just use this as handling space. And if we get beyond the 500 cows, I think you will probably be building modular pieces that look like that, perhaps with a central area for milk storage, for calving, uh, and then I would picture, say, far off dry cows at this side of this barn, fresh cows, maybe some lame cows you bring back in a bedding pack here with access to uh, at least two, two robots that uh, uh, would be you know, fairly underutilized. You might not have more than 80 cows in that group uh, so that they have lots of milking opportunity and lots of training opportunity for you because there will be more cows here uh, that you're taking to the robot on your own and it becomes a work center because the person could also be looking after cattle. So milk flows this way and cows flow this way. Manure and feed flows this way through this system. Uh, you might go instead of uh, you know uh, 120 cow groups here, add a third robot here and make them 180 cow groups uh, as one road to expansion. So to summarize, uh, 12 points: free traffic, open space in front of the robots, foot bathing in a separate lane, all robots facing the same way, simple routes for fetching. 
simple routes from group to group, a handling chute in the center of the barn, gating that one person can handle moving cows from anywhere to anywhere, flexible separation area, a good fresh and lame pack, a stress-free calving line, and perimeter feeding are a dozen things I like to build into a barn. So we'll end with a poll question, uh, and I'm looking to see if I've changed your perspective at all. So after this presentation, are you more inclined to renovate an existing barn, uh, most likely for free traffic, renovate an existing barn, most likely for guided traffic, build a new barn so that these things are easier to incorporate with free traffic or the other choice, guided traffic, or it all looks too complicated, Jack, I think I'll stick with my milking carton. <laughs> well, I think he's convinced me to build a new barn with free traffic, uh, Mike. <laughs> what so, do you think? Yeah, it sounds like a, a winner a winner to me as well. Uh, then it still gives me the flexibility of my old facility, I guess, if I have to uh, take hospital pens or whatever we want to do with that milking system there. So we're voting pretty aggressively here, uh, Jack. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're, uh, once we yeah, hit... We've got a clear winner there, so... Let's look at the poll results. All right, let's take a look at the poll results. Thank you, Jim. Jack, what do you think? Well, I, I, I think we went from about 40% new barns with free traffic to 62. So it it's always feels good if you can, yes. uh, can have an influence on your audience and, uh, and, and help them to change their mind a little bit about, uh, about what uh, future plans they might make. So. Uh, yeah, I'm ready for questions, uh, and uh, if I want to emphasize one thing as we wrap this up, uh, you need to really focus on cow comfort, uh, and you need to pay lots of attention to how you're going to handle these cows, and, and if you make those your priorities, I think you can uh, have a very, very good life in your new robotic milking system. Okay. Let's go to our next PowerPoint if we can. Steve, and why don't you uh, start uh, talking? Okay. Well, Jack uh, Rodenberg, thank you very much for a, a great presentation. Uh, you really gave us a lot of things to think about. I, I can just envision that uh, anyone who wants to begin to think about how that new robotic barn might look uh, would want to follow your presentation almost step by step to uh, to build those features into it. It was very well done and we appreciate it very much. We also appreciate the uh, sponsorship of, of Lely today. Let's, uh, before we get into our questions uh, and discussion, uh, let's look ahead a bit again. Uh, Mike Hutchins will be the next presenter, Feeding for Hoof Health, which was a good follow-up to uh, the lameness considerations that you mentioned, uh, Jack. Uh, that uh, webinar will be sponsored by Zenpro. And then looking ahead uh, to August, uh, Bob James, Virginia Tech, uh, a well-known calf and heifer uh, specialist, uh, will be giving us an update on raising better calves, and De Laval will be the sponsor of that. I want to add also at this time that those of you who are with us today, and we had a very nice large audience, uh, well over 100 people with us uh, live today. Uh, we'll be receiving a very brief survey here in a couple of days, and we certainly do appreciate your response. It'll just take a few seconds uh, to help us plan future webinars. And also, of course, after a few days, uh, this webinar uh, and all of our previous webinars, for that matter, uh, will be available on the Horge Dairyman webinar archives for viewing, uh, uh, reviewing, uh, or uh, for uh, your friends and colleagues that uh, you might want to refer to uh, the, the uh, presentation as well. So we remind you of that as well. With those comments, uh, Jack, I think we maybe flip one more uh, PowerPoint. There we go. And I'm going to uh, now turn things back to Mike Hutchins. Mike, would you have some questions? Yeah, we got a whole bunch, Jack. So uh, this is kind of the speed round. So here we go. Um, what does Jack feel the cost in lost milk due to disruption when using sand bedding or just moving cows and sorting? Uh, any any data on that? Uh, no, not uh, not any that I'm aware of. 
I mean, I I think that if I take the average of my sand bedded robot barns uh, and compare it to the average of all of them, uh, the milk production is higher. So uh, the uh, you know point one visit you might lose on the day you put the sand bedding in. Uh, you get back uh, very, very easily just through the improved cow comfort and improved cow health. Uh, so I'm, I'm still a big fan of sand bedding and robot barns. Uh, we often get asked, doesn't it wear the equipment out a lot faster? There are adaptations you can make to, uh, to deal with that as well. So. When you say wear out the equipment, are you talking, Jack, about the milking equipment? Uh, when you say wearing out the equipment? Yes, I'm talking about the robot arm, the uh, moving parts on the robot because, yeah, the sand, if, you, if you have sand bedding, there's sand everywhere and it gets on the equipment as well. So, uh, for example, with Lely robots, uh, they normally have rope retractors on the, uh, on the shells. Uh, in a sand barn, we would replace those with uh, very light, small chains. Uh, because if you used ropes in a sand barn, you would be changing broken ropes uh, once every two weeks. Okay, very good. Um, how big of a fresh pen would you have? I assume that square footage or however you want to do that, Jack, uh, makes sense? Yeah, it does. I think you want to have 120 square feet per cow as, as bedded area for whatever number of cows you want to put in there. Uh, and the number of cows is going to depend on how many lame cows you're going to have. So if you have sand bedding and uh, decent sized free stalls uh, on the other side of the robot, I'm going to say you don't need room for a lot of cows behind it. But if you're going to have a mattress with very little bedding on it and a slatted floor and so on, then I want more room in that, uh, in that bedding pack. So uh, I would say Per robot, uh, probably uh, room for three to five cows in your bed pack, uh, depending on how comfortable they are on the other side. So that's roughly about 10%. Is that right, Jack? Uh, 10 or 15% of the cows might be classified as lame cows in a typical robotic type system. By the way, we're not trying to box you in. Next month, you'll discover that number is even higher under non-robotic conditions. Yeah, no, I think you're a little high there. Uh, so if you're milking 60 cows per robot, and I'm saying if that's a sand bedded barn with comfortable cows, I want room for three to four cows in the pen behind. So that's uh, sort of six or seven percent. And if the comfort's not as great, then uh, then yeah, then maybe six cows, then maybe 10 percent. Okay, well, here comes a Donald Trump question, I think. It's kind of long. Uh, some producers I work with have said the free flow can also be an issue with heifers versus dominant cows, as the dominant cows will push the heifers away from the robot, and the open space provides no protection for the heifers, so those are going to have still fight their way in. Jack, do you see this as being an issue? Absolutely. Dominance and behavior are things that you need to deal with in robot barns. And even in a free traffic barn, you will see the more timid cows uh, strategically coming in times when there's very little uh, other activity going, going on in the barn uh, in terms of milking. So uh, show me the cow that gets milked at 2.30 in the morning show me the cow that gets milked while fresh feed is being delivered and all the other cows go to the feed bunk and I'll tell you that she's the timid cow in the herd. Uh, so yes, these interactions are part of the game and, and, and part of the situation uh, and, and you can still, in a free traffic setting, you can minimize the issues for that heifer uh, by giving her lots of space and by giving her escape routes. Uh, if you have multiple robots and you can group them, then certainly separating the younger cows from the older cows uh, will reduce some of that uh, stress. Uh, but there's always going to be a hierarchy and you always have to deal with that. In a parlor barn, you have to deal with it by having at least two water troughs per group. Uh, and, and here you have to deal with it by also making sure they have good access to the robot. 
So, Jack, if I had discovered I had four or six dominant cows, I realize I'll find higher. Should I put them all in one robot and just get get them out of the and put all the heifers on or to more timid cows on the other robot? Any any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think it is uh, advantageous uh, to, uh, to to do that. We're getting good results by grouping by by age, by separating the older cows from the heifers, uh, and and. But you know that that like there always will be that range, and it doesn't matter a whole lot uh, how you how you group them. Okay, um, you're losing ground here. Just so you know that isn't isn't spraying uh, f- uh, isn't spraying foot baths on the feed lane easier than forcing the cows through a far end foot bath? Does that make sense to you? So spraying. Uh, th- uh, on the feed lane rather than going through a foot bath in a robotic milker. Ever seen that? Okay, I, I don't really understand spraying in the feed lane. I, I have seen some farmers uh, spraying hooves of cows while they're at the manger in headlocks and so on. I'm not sure that that's an effective alternative to foot bathing. Uh, there are some commercial systems available uh, that will spray off the cow's rear feet and apply a chemical if you want right in the robot uh, after milking is completed. Uh, they're expensive systems, but they seem to work reasonably well. We get some mixed reviews on them. Uh, but yeah, in my mind, I want to uh, uh, foot bathe the exiting cow in a separate lane uh, rather than doing it at the far end of the barn because doing it at the far end of the barn means that I have to herd the whole herd through there, uh, and that's a stress on those cows again and also takes time uh, out of my day. Yeah, just a clarification, the gentleman who asked that question said is manual spraying, uh, you know, when the cows are in the headlock. So basically um, doing it at that point, and you pretty well covered that. Here's a kudo for you so you can feel good. It says, uh, we've been in our facility for six months, designed by our son that greatly influenced by you. Thanks very much. It leads me into another question. Should you be looking for outside expertise or will the companies provide enough there, Jack, uh, to be rather candid? Well, I, I, I personally think that the expertise of the company varies a great deal from area to area. The dealers are, are just very different in their approach. Uh, and I also have to say that occasionally I see dealers that uh, design more from self-interest than from, uh, from interest in the farmer. And, and you know, I suspect that a lot of these robots that are in little lean-tos on the outside of barns uh, are there because the dealer made that decision and he's just very, very happy to have that good an access to his equipment and, and, uh, and access for putting chemicals in and so on. But it's not the right spot if you want the ability to separate cows and so on. Okay, well, what about heat stress control in these robotic uh, barns, uh, milking systems? What do you think? It's important. Uh, it's really no different than it is uh, in any other barn in terms of how you do it and what your what your choices are uh, you uh, you do have to realize that you know these enclosed robot rooms if they are in the middle of the barn uh, then they could block uh, ventilation especially if in a tunnel ventilation system uh, fairly badly and so you may want to add some you know, some extra inlets, uh, say on top of the robot room or some baffles or whatever to deal with that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, just as important or more important than it is in, in other barns. Uh, one sort of side point, uh, I had someone tell me, you know, we should take that 20 feet in front of the robot and ventilate it really, really well with a tube system or something like that. And, and all that just, that it sounds good at first, but if you think it through, the last thing you want to do is attract more cows to that space that are not going for milking. So ventilate your whole barn really, really well, as well as you can, but don't make the area in front of the robot special because then you'll have lots of cows standing around there that are just blocking the entrance to the robot. 
If you want to make the cow super comfortable in the robot itself by putting some fans over top of her to keep the flies off and keep her cool, I'm all for that, though. I think that's a good idea. Well, let's build on that, Jack. What about rubber in the robot? Uh, can you put rubber in the robot to give her comfort when she stands in there to be milked? And I think you already answered it on the holding area or the area there uh, that you would discourage that for the same reason as far as heat stress. Is that correct? Yes, I probably wouldn't put ro rubber in front of the robots because, again, that might encourage other cows to come and stand there. In the robot, absolutely, uh, especially in all the models where the cow has to turn going in and turn going out uh, or in my separation lanes and so on. Um, a place where a cow has to make a sharp turn is a really good place uh, to put some rubber. A place where we know she has to stand still for a period of time is the second great place to put it. So uh, for sure, it's uh, in the right spots done strategically. It can be very useful. Well, I'm not sure I understand this question, so listen carefully. In an L-shaped layout, how much of a problem would it be to have a right and a left robot instead of having both of them on the right or the left? Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. And uh, there are actually some dealers now that are installing them. So they have a, light, a left and a right. Uh, and the entrance points are as far away as possible from each other. So they're at the tips of the L. And the exit points are common and close to the center. Uh, it makes uh, handling for separation quite simple. It uh, probably uh, is a nice layout in terms of, of uh, you know, having good entry areas to the robots. Uh, my main difficulty with it is uh, twofold. Uh, one, uh, I don't see how I can make my foot bath lane work there because I wouldn't know how to bring the cow back into the barn. Uh, the second one, if you're willing to foot bath at the far end of the barn or whatever, uh, is, is uh, that with this option, uh, you still need to make sure cows know how to use both a left and a right hand robot. And in a lot of barns, they are trained on one specific robot initially, and you'll find cows will continue to prefer that robot. Uh, I also have, I've studied this quite in, in, in quite a bit of detail, and even cows that might get their initial training on a left robot, they, some of them will settle on a right and still use it 90% of the time. So uh, I like to have all my robots facing the same way in a barn if possible, so that if one is down for service, the cow is confidently going to go uh, to the other one. With, uh, both, uh, le with both a left and a right in the same L, there might be a few cows that would be unwilling to do that. But, you know, they are exposed to both all the time, so probably most cows will use both of them. Do you feel that slats have a negative effect on hoof, uh, on foot or hoof health? Uh, I think that slats have a negative effect on the structural uh, strength of the leg, especially when you first introduce cows. Uh, to slats. So cows that are new to a slat barn, you'll do some culling because cows don't adapt very well. Slat barns tend to be relatively dry, especially if you run a, you know, a, a robotic slat scraper on top. So uh, I think hoof health from the standpoint of you know, foot rot issues, issues related to wet feet, uh, tend to be somewhat less. But if you're asking about cow comfort, I know for sure that if a cow has a choice of walking on a solid floor or a slatted floor, she always chooses the solid floor. So at the end of the day, cow comfort is higher on solid floor barns. I'm pretty sure of that. Here's your last question, and then we'll let you go, Steve, and get it back to you. Does the ideal, what is the ideal design for grazing setups? Any idea, any suggestions on grazing setups with the robotic milkers, and can you use them? Yes, you can. It is more challenging uh, because it's, it's uh, harder to get even access and continuous use of the robot. The uh, uh, most successful pasture barns will look very similar in the barn uh, to what I've described. 
and then there will be grazeway gates uh, at the uh, at the exit from the barn, uh, and the uh, the bigger herds, especially in in, uh, in New Zealand and Australia and so on, they're learning that you need to use a three-way grazing system. So you change the cows' power access every eight hours, and the stragglers come in, get milked, and go on to the next pasture. At the end of that. Uh, and the aggressive cows come in to get that fresh pasture as soon as they can. Uh, and by changing the pasture three times a day, uh, you can get very good flow through the robots and get over two milkings per cow per day and so on quite easily. Wow, very good. Well, Jack, great answers here. I think they're all right, too. Uh, Steve, we'll turn it back for you to, to wrap it up. Very nice job, uh, both with the presentation and the and the questions. Jack Rodenberg, appreciate it very much. Great, great presentation. Uh, we also want to show our appreciation to uh, Lele for their sponsorship of today's webinar. And again, as always, our thanks to Mike Hutchins and Jim Baldstein, University of Illinois, our, our partners in our webinar series. Thank you all for being uh, with us today. We hope to have you with us again. Uh, on July 11th, uh, when uh, ZenPro will be sponsoring the uh, Mike Hutchins presentation on feeding for foot health. So uh, that's uh, Steve Larson up here at Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, with the Horde Dairyman staff signing off. Thanks again for being with us today. <laughs>